The people of New York, just sitting down for dinner, had no concept of what approached them at astronomical speed. Before it could be seen, the sound of its six jet engines could be heard, pushing it through the sky. The war had raged on in Europe, brave soldiers dying every day to protect the freedom they enjoyed. However, never did they believe that the atrocities across the Atlantic would come bearing down upon them. They searched the skies as the air raid sirens swelled to life. Just like that, it broke through the clouds. It was unlike any airplane they had seen before. It swept back profile like one massive wing. This was the America Bomber, Hitler's answer to silence America and engulf the world in the flames of war. In 1943, Hermann Goering requested design proposals for a light bomber able to meet the 3 by 1,000 requirement. The head of the Luftwaffe wanted an aircraft capable of flying 1,000 kilometers with a bomb load of 1,000 kilos at a speed of 1,000 kilometers per hour. Goering's stringent requirements necessitated new designs from the major German airplane manufacturers Junkers, Messerschmitt, Focke Wolf. Heinkel, and the lesser-known Horton brothers. The Horton HO-229 soon came to the forefront, meeting most of the selection criteria. It was a miracle of Nazi engineering. He looked upon the flying wing which had been designed with only one purpose in mind. Many plans for Wunderwaffe were under development, Hitler's hopes of turning the tide of the war. The V-1 and V-2 vengeance weapons were planned for Britain. But in Hitler's arrogance, he now planned to bring the behemoth into war. America. His pact with Japan demanded that Germany would initiate war with America if Japan was engaged with them. But would Japan return the favor and invade the USSR? Unlikely. Hitler's plan was folly. None of that mattered to him. His job was to fly this colossal bomber across the Atlantic Ocean and show the Americans even they were not beyond the reach of the Third Reich. He would bring the America bomber to their nation's pride of development and economics, New York. His Horton would rain fire down upon the unsuspecting citizens, letting them know that the war was no longer on a distant continent, but on their doorstep. Due to the speed requirements, traditional propeller engines would not suffice, and instead, jet propulsion became a necessity. At the time, only the Junker Yumo 004 turbojet was available in sufficient numbers itself being the first production-based jet engine. The engine became famous for powering the Messerschmitt ME-262 fighter, but it wasn't always guaranteed for production. Based on the 1937 design of Hans von Ohen of Heinkel, the upper echelons of the German Reich Air Ministry showed little interest in the project. Fortunately, Helmut Schelp and Hans Mau did and urged the manufacturers to conduct research and advancements on their own. In 1939, Dr. Anselm Frenz of Junkers Jumo, Junkers Motorenwerke, became the leader of the project utilizing an axial flow engine versus the centrifugal design which was being developed at the same time in Britain by Frank Whittle. The Junkers Jumo 004 was chosen over the BMW 03 turbojet for the Horn HO229, as it was production ready first. These early jet engines proved to be very fuel hungry so a sleek and aerodynamic design would be needed in order to maximize the distance this new fighter would fly. The Horton brothers, Walter and Reimar, had flown early in World War II, Walter on the Western Front, while Reimar was transferred to the Glider Pilot School in Braunschweig after training in the ME-109. Due to the Treaty of Versailles signed after World War I, Germany had been banned from having any type of air force. This led to advancements in training on gliders occurring through flying clubs under the watchful eye of World War I veteran pilots. The two brothers became intrigued with alternative designs, 
leading to the first Horton Glider in 1933, when the brothers were merely 18 and 19 years old. This early design glider would go on to become the HO-229, and later a leading candidate for the America bomber. After the demise of the Third Reich, the brothers would live on into the late 1990s. Reimar passed away in 1994 in Argentina, still working on plane designs, while Walter passed in 1998 after joining the post-war German Air Force. He fired up the engines, the roar of the jet turbines coming to life. It was the beginning of the jet era. Could it also be the beginning of the transatlantic bomber? He slammed the throttles down as he picked up speed, approaching the end of the runway. The nose pulled up, and he began to ascend. It was too late now. There was only one goal now in his mind. He approached the limits of the right-controlled territory. On his side, he waved to the fighter pilot besides him. The man returned to Sieg Heil and pulled off. He was alone now. He cruised at 650 kilometers an hour. The voyage would take him almost 10 hours to cover the 6,000 kilometers to New York. Nothing to do now but focus on the plan and stay vigilant. While the HO-229 was never fully tested, it was estimated that its top speed would fall just short of Goering's requirements, coming in at around 960 kilometers per hour. There was never a full range test, but the expectation was that it could top 1,900 kilometers in range. In regards to the final requirements of 1,000 kilos of bombs, the HO-229 was rated for 4,000 kilos, far exceeding the Luftwaffe's requirements. Let's take a brief look over the flying wing's design. It had a wingspan of 16.8 meters, a length of 7.47 meters, and a height of 2.81 meters. Its empty weight came in at 5 tons, with a gross weight of 9 tons. Propulsion was via two Junkers Jumo turbojet engines, with a combined thrust of almost 18 kilonewtons. The HO-229 was constructed primarily of wood, with the wings being made from plywood as well as the fuselage. A metal internal structure was utilized, as well as a charcoal and sawdust-based glue, which was expected to reduce radar signature. A retractable tricycle layout landing gear system was utilized as well as a drogue parachute for landings and a rudimentary ejection seat. As is obvious by the design, it lacked a rudder and other observable airplane features. This could lead to the aircraft being relatively unstable. Instead, it utilized a system of elevons and spoilers. However, this was not its only concern. On the 18th of February 1945, the third test flight crashed and was a complete loss. The test pilot, Erwin Ziller, was observed to have one of his engines catch fire and then stop. He tried repeatedly to climb the aircraft and dive to restart the engine, but was unsuccessful. Eventually, crashing and dying two weeks later due to injuries. The prototype was a total loss. When the 3x1000 project was first announced, it soon became apparent that the HO-229 was the only plane that could possibly reach the projected goals. Though the Horton brothers had won the contract, it would come with a caveat that they heavily disliked. Due to the brothers' lack of sufficient production facilities, the work was contracted out to Gotar Wagenfabrik. This was against the brothers' wishes, but they had no choice in the matter. It was rumored and speculated that Gothar intentionally sabotaged the work on the HO-229 in favor of their own designs. Towards the end of the war, the HO-229 was to reach its most ambitious iteration, the America Bomber. Though plans had already begun in 1938, it wasn't until 1942 that Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering was presented with the idea. A bomber capable of flying to New York and back, a round trip of approximately 11,600 kilometers. It didn't take long until it became obvious that such a concept was unfeasible. A lack of resources, specialized materials, or technically overwhelming concepts meant that it was not meant to be. The hours passed slowly, his mind going over the flight plan. Decimation of the Pride of America, New York. 
thousands upon thousands screaming as his bombs destroyed buildings, parks, and homes. Thousands, tens of thousands, dead. But really, were they the enemy? Didn't they have families as well? Fathers, mothers, children. Focus! Follow the Fuhrer's orders. Many different proposals were put forward, such as the Messerschmitt ME-264, the Focke Wolf TA-400, Junker JU-390, and the Heinkel HE-277. Even more unconventional plans have been put forward, including the Huckapack project, the Piggyback project, an ambitious and complex plan which involved the Heinkel HE-177 bomber, carrying a Dornier DO-217 and powered by a ramjet. The HT-177 would carry the Dornier as far as it could across the Atlantic, before turning back to base. The Dornier would then proceed alone, bombing America before ditching off the east coast of America. A waiting U-boat would then recover the crew. Another possibility was the infamous Silbervogel, Silver Bird. A suborbital bomber, this was basically a modified wing version of the V-2 rocket. It would eventually become a two-staged intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM. However, the Horton brothers weren't through with just their HO-229 design. Enter the Horton H-18. In many respects, this bomber was simply a scaled-up version of the HO-229. Three variants were considered for the America bomber. Variant A was powered by six turbojets, in contrast to the two of the HO-229. The landing gear was jettisonable, and it was intended to have a rudder fin as well as engine pods beneath the wings. Like the HO-229 and its cooperation with Gotar, the Horden brothers were ordered to share information with Junkers and Messerschmitt, much to their dismay. Variant B was similar, but had the engine count reduced to four, and four-wheel retractable landing gear which was to be housed in underwing pods. Defense was considered unnecessary due to its high performance. This project never left the planning stages. The final variant, C, was developed primarily by Junkers and Messerschmitt. This design used six BMW 003 turbojet engines. As well as a much enlarged tail, it housed an MG-151 turret in the rear. This plan was eventually rejected, as it showed little advancement over variant A. Imagine, though, if you can, the sight of a massive wing bearing down from above. In fact, 40 years later, the concept would come true with the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit. The most famous stealth bomber flying wing design, it had the range to cover a transatlantic return flight. It's clear the inspiration and evolution from the Horn brothers lived on. There, in the distance, he could see it. New York. The sun was just rising. It was a day that would live long in their collective memories. He opened his Bombay doors and prepared for his final run. He began his descent. In the distance, the air raid sirens swarmed to life. What a sight to behold he must have been. This colossal flying wing, the epitome of German engineering. He was overhead now. His moment had come. He reached for the bomb release. His hand wavered over the lever, then moved to the bomb bay doors. He closed them. He opened his mic. Dies ist der deutsche Intercontinental Bomber Horton H-18. Meine Mission ist es, New York zu zerstören. Ich habe meine Bombenschacht Küren geschlossen. Ich möchte mein Flugzeug an die Regierung der Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika übergeben. He followed the orders given to him as an escort of fighters surrounded the bomb. They wanted the technology, but they feared it was a ruse. It wasn't. Hitler's plans to engage America were folly. He set the plane down gently on a runway. He would live out the war in America, the knowledge that he had saved thousands of lives. Enough for him to live down the name of traitor they would surely brand him with. Operation Paperclip was a US intelligence program aimed at securing the brains behind the Nazi war machine and bringing them back to America. 
The final H-9 V-3 version of the HO-229 was captured near the end of the war by General Patton's 3rd Army and brought back to America for analysis. Many advancements in the decades that followed could be traced back to the machines of war built by the Nazi Third Reich. To think, almost 100 years ago, two brothers would have the foresight and imagination to construct the world's first flying wing. Concepts that have been utilized and live on today. If a war that engulfed the world hadn't been raging, what could their efforts have otherwise been redirected at? Imagine the peace and tranquility of gliding through the skies effortlessly upon nothing but a wing.